Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Providing STD and Reproductive Health Services in a Rural Setting, the story of the Durango High School School-Based Health Center. Uh, for the millionth time, I'm Sandra Sedna-Smith, uh, Program Manager with the National Coalition of STD Directors in charge of our Adolescent Health Initiatives. Uh, we welcome you to this webinar. I'm really excited uh, to be producing this webinar and presenting it. Um, it, basically, we, um, from, for our adolescent health portfolio, NCSD, we provide technical assistance to our members and key stakeholders around the issues of, of course, STD, HIV, and teen pregnancy prevention. Um, in addition to that, this is actually the fourth webinar in a series of webinars on uh, STD and reproductive health services for adolescents specifically. Our previous three webinars, the late, uh, latest, most recent one occurred a couple of weeks ago on May 10th, focused on STD screening in a school setting. This, uh, this one does have a bit of that focus, but um, also uh, a broader uh, Big Ten focus regarding um, school-based health centers and particularly in a rural setting and providing such services to uh, rural populations. Um, just to give you guys a, a quick background why, why we're covering this topic, um, those of you who received the um, web description or webinar description before you joined, um, as, as you guys know, in uh, 2010, last year, we established, NCSD established a rural health task force um, as a means to addressing the needs of our members in rural states um, and uh, provide a, a venue for them to connect with, with their peers and discuss some of their issues. Um, in addition to that, based on the other webinars in this series, we always do evaluations at the end. And we received a lot of great feedback, particularly from the two that we conducted in September of last year. And it was very, very obvious that uh, those who participated really felt a need for um, a webinar that focused on these activities in a rural setting or socially conservative setting. Um, so here we are. I was blessed enough to uh, do a little research and, and find the fabulous people uh, in Durango, Colorado. And um, we're just excited to do this. So um, what I'd like to do right now is just let you know about the technology, real brief, very basic. Um, obviously, the line is super quiet because we muted everyone uh, on the phone with the exception of our presenters, of course. This is just to eliminate um, feedback and the background noise um, and just make a more pleasant recording and listening experience for you. Um, you'll notice on the uh, left-hand side of your viewing screen, you have a chat box. Um, during the presentation, you'll be able to ask questions via chat. However, there will be a designated um, Q&A period, the final 20 to 30 minutes of this presentation. So don't panic if your question is not answered right away. Um, I will be tracking that while our presenters are, are dis discussing and uh, presenting their information. And then we will get to your questions towards the end. But that is what the chat box is for. Um, also, we have, as you guys know, we're recording this. It will be archived. Um, I will distribute the archive and any additional resources the presenters may want to share with you um, within a week from today. Uh, additionally, whenever the NCSD website is up, we will also have links to all of our, our webinars posted. So I'd like to introduce you to your speakers for today. We have um, Sherrod Beal and Patsy Ford. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read their bios. Sherrod has worked as a pediatric nurse practitioner for 23 years and is currently employed by the 9R School District as the health coordinator. This position oversees operations and funding for the school-based health centers at Durango High School and Florida Mesa Elementary. The district 
uh, the district registered nurses, the health educators, and the Medicaid Extended School Health Program. She also provides health care one day a week as a nurse practitioner in the school-based health center at Durango High. Sherrod has an extensive background in public health and in education and has been involved in developing and providing health care in school-based health centers for the past 10 years in Colorado. Prior to her involvement in K-12 schools, she has taught for 10 years at the University of Utah and developed partnerships between public health and the university to meet the needs of low-income children in Salt Lake City. She has supported and promoted the connection between health and educational achievement for underserved children throughout her career and has won numerous awards in her efforts. Patsy Ford has worked as a registered nurse for 36 years, including over 26 years as a public health nurse in rural Colorado. She is currently employed by the San Juan Basin Health Department in Durango, Colorado as director of the Personal Health Division. This position oversees 57 employees and 38 public health programs. Since March of 2011, Patsy has also served as the health department's acting director. This interim position oversees all health department operations and funding. During Patsy's tenure as Personal Health Division Director, she supported the development of an effective collaborative relationship between San Juan Basin Health Department and the 9R District School-Based Health Center at Durango High School. Shared work includes the establishment and oversight of a Title X Family Planning Satellite Site, which is the first in Colorado, on-site provision of required and recommended vaccines for school-age students, and dental screening for 9R students. For 18 years prior to her employment with the health department, Patsy has worked in another rural public health agency in Northwest Colorado. Throughout her career, she has supported the public health model as an effective way to deliver preventative services to adolescents and children in Colorado. And then, of course, uh, we hope that by listening to our fabulous speakers, you will be able to describe the development and continued evolution of the Durango High School-Based Health Center over time, discuss how comprehensive STD and reproductive health services are provided to Durango High students on premises, and finally, name at least two strategies for successfully providing STD and reproductive health services to youth in a rural setting. And now that I've covered the basics, I'm delighted to hand this off to our presenters. Patsy and Sherrod, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, this is Sherrod, and um, I'm going to start out uh, just to give you a little context of where we're coming from, and hope, hopefully we can get some input from you all. Um, I'd like to stress that today, uh, what I'm really, what we're really trying to do is give you a sense of process and a sense of strategy versus focusing on a lot of data. So your input is going to be um, important because we'd like to hear from you because it's an ongoing process of trying to deliver care to adolescents in rural areas. So um, here we go. Just to give you a, an idea of where are we in Colorado in case, you know, you kind of forgot. Um, let's see. We want to bring up this map. So just to point out where Colorado is, we have this little, I know I can use this tool, but of course we're in this little orange square right in the middle, and I'd like to point out that we are um, in the very far southwest corner, so we're part of the Four Corners area. Um, in case you're not having a good day, uh, just want to show you some nice pictures of what the surrounding area looks like around Durango. I do a lot of backpacking, and this is, um, this is a picture of one area that I've been to, and there's quite a few of them, but just gives you a taste. Not trying to make you jealous, but hey. Um, so um, this, uh, this slide, and I'll just have to get used to this just a little bit. Okay, just to give you, hopefully you saw those slides, just to give you a taste of where we are. But I would like, I'm, I'm not going to present a lot of background on school-based health centers, but I wanted to find out poll-wise just if most people that, I'm, that we're talking to are familiar with school-based health centers. So if you can just take a minute and uh, respond yes or no.
Okay, great. So um, we're still getting some responses. And it looks like the majority of people, 25 said yes, I don't know what you see on your screen, 8 said no. So uh, please feel free to ask questions at the end if you need more clarification. Um, so I think most of us are starting with a, a common base. The other thing I wanted to ask folks about is um, uh, whether or not you live in a rural area, just to kind of get a sense of where you're at. Okay, so it looks like uh, this, that the majority, 23, 24 responses were no, they don't live in a rural area. So I'm glad I brought some pictures. And uh, nine responses were yes. So um, this will be interesting because I'd love to, to hear your feedback. Okay, so it's a good opportunity to kind of discuss a little bit about what is rural. Um, and this pertains specifically to Colorado. But um, in Colorado, 84.5% population resides along the front range. And that is considered, most of that area is considered um, urban. And only 15.5% of the population do live in a rural area. We have 64 counties in Colorado. Um, as you can see, the, uh, 17 are metropolitan, but the majority of them are rural. And we still have frontier, uh, which is that there are less than six people per square mile. And of course, that frontier area is 43% of the land mass. So there is some um, concentration of folks um, in rural and urban areas, but the majority of the land mass is still open. OK, the, uh, yep, let's go back. Um, definition of rural. Uh, the federal government has more than 15 different definitions of rural. I looked them up, and it depends on what portion of the census is used, um, and also what are the, the spending priorities. The general rule for rural overall is that it's less than 50,000 population as far as density. And another important aspect of rural is, um, which we talk about with funding, is whether or not that area has been designated as a medically underserved area or it's been designated and or as a health provider shortage area, because these are important. Um, aspects of, of rural when you're applying for grants. And also, there's another definition that's called, um, you can just tell by looking. Uh, this is kind of a, um, an example of that. Uh, this is downtown Durango during the winter. And so um, you can come to a conclusion based on that. OK. So if we're looking at school-based health centers in Colorado, we have 47 school-based health centers. 35 of them are urban, and only 12 are rural. Uh, so we're all in the same boat, kind of struggling to try and provide uh, services for kids. And this is just a map of all the counties of Colorado. And uh, as you know, it's La Plata County, which is where Durango is located, is way down in the southwest corner. And it is, um, as I talk a little bit about Durango, it is extremely rural. Um, the majority of these um, in, in yellow are rural. Um, we, the green are urban, and then the blues are still frontier areas. And we have very few school-based health centers in the frontier area because of low population density. But um, they probably need, they are still well needed. So if we talk about Durango, our population as a town is 20,000. The county is 55,000. Durango itself has one high school, two middle schools, seven elementary schools. So we have 10 schools total. High school itself has 1,000, approximately 1,250 students. And at any given time in the building, we have 1,400 people. That is the most concentrated area in Durango at any given time is the high school. Our main industry is tourism, which is uh, we find in a lot of rural areas. And it presents a problem in and of itself with regard to funding. Uh, because you have a lot of people with higher incomes that visit the area, that retire in the area, and so it can skew some of the numbers when you're writing grants. Also, just to give you an idea, is that Denver by car is seven hours away, um, and Albuquerque is four hours away, and you have to go over mountain passes to get to any one of those places. So you can't just get there from here. Uh, 
and because we're talking about STDs, I had I didn't want to throw in a lot of data. I know you all are probably aware of it, but I did want to just uh, bring to mind a little bit of data. And the reason why we're here today is because STDs is a huge concern um, in the adolescent population. So if we're looking at the CDC 2009 STD sur surveillance, if you look at Colorado, which is 405 um, per 100,000, that's rate right for the entire population, which is similar to uh, the United States in general, which is 406.3 per 100,000. Uh, that is chlamydia just in and of itself um, per population. But then if you look at the rates in adolescence, as you can see, um, and as you all well know, if you look from 15 to 19, it is 3,329.3 3 per 100,000 for females and 735.5 uh, for males. And that's just 15 to 19, and we have something similar, 20 to 24. So the difference in adolescence is massive. That's why this is an issue that has to be addressed. Once again, if we're looking at the general um, regions uh, that are divided up based on Title X, um, Durango and Colorado are part of Region 8. And in each of these regions, no matter which one you look at, you can see with Region 8 that the rates continue to go up. And this is positivity, so how many, um, the uh, percentage of positives that you have um, continues to go up. And that, we don't know, of course, if that is better screening, more accessibility um, for teenagers, or if that's increased just in the incidence itself. But it's of concern. Same thing with um, gonorrhea. If we look at the teenage population, um, in terms of U.S. rates overall, uh, it's about 99.3 per 100,000 general population. Once again, if we look at adolescence in 15 to 19 and 20 to 24, uh, we have uh, five times those rates, and that is uh, extremely concerning. So that is to set the stage a little bit for uh, data. And I just want to look at trends in Colorado, which I'm sure you're seeing in your states as well. But if we look at these trends, um, the red and blue lines are gonorrhea, and they've gone down a little bit. Um, between 2007 and 2008, we did see a decrease in those rates. So Colorado is less than that, but it does parallel what those rates are. And then if you look at the yellow and the purple line, uh, or the green line, the concern with the green line, of course, is with um, in terms of chlamydia. Uh, the rates still remain high in the U.S., and in Colorado, they continue to climb. So it's just looking at trends. The reason why we want to look at trends of course, is because when we're messaging in rural areas trying to obtain services, we have to keep the, this data and we have to keep these trends in mind because we want to communicate why this is so important um, to um, the population that we're trying to serve. So uh, I don't want to do all the talking, but the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is around policy because we have to keep policy in mind um, as we try and continue to make progress toward providing services, reproductive and STD services. So I wanted to talk about a little bit in Colorado, and um, I, I'm sure you all have looked at the Guttmacher Institute website, which documents um, every state and um, where the minor consent laws fall specifically for that state. And in terms of Colorado, um, any minor can receive contraceptives, seek contraceptives, can uh, receive STI or STD uh, screening and treatment, can also receive prenatal care uh, without parental consent. They have to be 15 or older to receive mental health services. And this is important because when we're treating uh, adolescents, we need to treat them comprehensively. Substance abuse can be screened and treated at any age, and abortion is, is um, still legal but requires parental notification. The other part of confidentiality are the HIPAA and FERPA laws that govern um, records in the school system, and that is still extremely complicated, and everybody kind of has a little bit of their own interpretation of that. Um, but it, it's important to understand, and I'm not going to go into depth in this, in this um, webinar, 
but it needs to be understood. And one other um, policy that we've achieved here in Colorado that's been important is the comprehensive sex ed um, law in schools, and that's House Bill 1292, which was uh, went through the legislature in 2007. And what it requires is scientific research for sex ed in the schools, and that whatever is provided must be comprehensive. And uh, that sets a stage that allows us to provide reproductive health services in a school setting. So uh, policy is extremely important. In general, and uh, I think uh, this is probably throughout the country, but in a school-based health center setting, um, when we define what are preventive and primary reproductive health services, most school-based health centers provide some type of human sexuality education. Um, they provide a comprehensive behavioral risk assessment. We'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, which is extremely important because STDs are not an isolated um, incident. Uh, they provide some type of counseling, uh, pregnancy testing, some type of contraceptive or referral for contraception, and generally some diagnosis and treatment of sexually transmitted infections or diseases. Uh, that is what's offered in general. The reason I think why Durango High School has come to the forefront is that we are the only school-based health center in Colorado that has partnered with Title X services at the um, San Juan Basin Health Department. And Patsy will talk a little bit more about that. But we're the only one that have done that, and it's been a very successful strategy for us. So we'd like to highlight that a little bit for you. Um, there are, are 38 of our uh, school-based health centers provide some sort of reproductive health services, different combinations in Colorado. About 20 dispense contraceptives of some sort. Sometimes it's just um, they go out and collect samples and they dispense them. Um, but pretty much most school-based health centers, if they're rural or urban, do do testing for um, STIs or STDs. So, that is less of a problem. Whether or not they're treated is another issue. Um, and then trying to get a school-based health center into a school in a rural area is a whole other issue in and of itself. And I must say that we have a close partnership with the Colorado Association of School-Based Health Centers. And in 2009, which is available on, off of their website, they, de they developed an adolescent reproductive toolkit. And this is how do you get reproductive services into a school-based health center. Um, and they also have a toolkit on how do you start a school-based health center to begin with. So um, I'm not going to go into detail, as I said once again, but we are going to talk some of, um, some strategies around that. OK. So a little bit of our background. Um, before we even got a school-based health center started, which was in 2007, it's really important to look at the context of doing that. Um, our community history was that at a time we had a community health center and it closed. It was um, a federally qualified health center, but it was actually the origin was from Alamosa. It was from a different county. We didn't have our own federally qualified health center. And um, because of funds, they closed. So we had about 12,000 people without any health care. And not having a community health center, there was no access for individuals without any insurance except at um, except for reproductive health services at San Juan Basin Health Department. And also at the same time, we obtained a federal designation of a medically underserved area and a health sh shortage provider area, which was very important in obtaining grants. Uh, the other thing we were able to do um, prior to uh, trying to establish a school-based health center is that we were able to receive support from the superintendent at that time. It's a woman named Mary Barter. And uh, she was pushing through a bond issue to renovate school buildings and had said that if that went through that she would put space into the high school for a school-based health center. Also, we put in place a wellness policy. And the other thing that was put in place was coordinated school health. And we'll talk about the importance of having reproductive health screening for STDs to be part of a system, uh, rather than simply plop down somewhere in the school. And coordinated school health looks at multiple aspects of school health. Um, a school-based health 
center only being one part of that. But looking at the whole system has been very important for us to move forward in obtaining all of the services that we've been able to obtain. So um, I'm going to just talk about our initial phase, uh, which was in 2006-2007. We did a pl that year we obtained a planning grant for 15,000 to Star School Based Health Center. They hired a consultant, which was me at the time, and uh, we put together a community advisory council. Um, Patsy was part of that. I'll let her go into depth about that. And uh, we put together a needs assessment and also developed a service delivery model. So um, San Juan Basin Health has been a, an active participant in the development of the school-based health center uh, throughout. And one of the ways that we've been able to par participate and uh, lend support is through um, being a member of the Community Advisory Council because that's where a lot of the discussion took place about how to best deliver services, particularly um, to adolescents. We um, knew that we had a common population in a small rural area like this. We share clients. Uh, adolescents have been receiving, have continually received uh, Title X um, reproductive health services at the health department. But there's always the issue of having adolescents be able to get there, transportation, being pulled out of school. So we um, started talking about how we can better deliver care to the adolescent population. Um, so that's when we um, thought we could partner and collaborate in um, creating a, an official Title X satellite site at the school-based health center. And the way that we, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead here, but the way that we funded that was uh, through um, blended funding. We um, had some funding available to us through the grants through 9R and the school-based health center, but we also had, um, we utilized our maternal child health funds to provide consultation with the director of our family planning services at, at San Juan Basin Health. So we, um, one of our uh, goals, maternal child health goals, was to um, assist in the development of school-based health centers, and so we were able to provide personnel to actually provide consultation and pull in the Title X state um, program uh, so that we can, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead to, that's the second year, so I'll stop there. <laughs> um, and uh, we just want to focus that these partnerships are crucial. One thing that we did after we did the planning year, in our first year, we did not provide reproductive health care, and that was a uh, decided strategy of the advisory council. Uh, we decided that because of the nature of reproductive health, and uh, it was going to be controversial, of, of course, um, Drangle, although it is a little bit more progressive, it is still part of a rural community. It's a big ranching community. And so we decided the first year we would focus just on school-based health center services um, and kind of an integration of services in a comprehensive approach to child health. And uh, the first year we only had part-time personnel, but our focus was we wanted to get parents and the community aware of the types of things we could do as a school-based health center that could not be done elsewhere. So their, chi their child could stay in school and be seen. We would contact them. They would be um, involved in the child's care. And uh, so uh, that proved to be a good decision. And um, in order to receive care at the school-based health center initially, uh, we had parents simply sign a consent at registration, and it listed reproductive health services, uh, but uh, we did not offer them. And, uh, and really, we kind of played it in the background. We just focused on comprehensive health. So uh, just to show you a, a picture, um, let's see, on my slides. So, one of, this is the opening to our school-based health center, and the other thing that we established was confidentiality. Before we went anywhere is how confidential would we be, and we decided that 
uh, we would maintain confidentiality except if a child was um, about to commit suicide, uh, was about to commit uh, murder, or someone was hurting them, or um, if uh, either of those conditions existed. So those were the three areas that we would break confidentiality. But other than that, we were able to establish an environment of confidentiality which brought the kids in right away. Uh, just to take a look as, uh, as you look at our school-based health center looking into it, just want to point out that um, every room, our behavioral health room, our, um, our education room, our exam room are all connected by doors. And this is purposeful because we integrate. Uh, we share mental health, behavioral health, uh, reproductive health when we started that. But um, that is all in one chart. And often a behavioral health therapist as well as a primary care provider will interview a student when we have issues along the same um, um, for that child. And this integrated comprehensive care became that became the focus uh, for the community. So in our second year, we opened full time. And this is when we decided to introduce reproductive health. And as Pat, Patsy mentioned, um, we are, one of our, our, our biggest focuses, well, how do we get contraceptives? How do we have standards of care? Um, what would the community accept? And because there was already a Title X program at the health department, um, we came up with the idea that, well, let's just partner with the health department. And originally, you know, I was pretty uh, thinking, okay, I'll go over there, get a basket, load it up with contraceptives, and I'll just bring it back to the school-based health center. And I was like, no, 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 no. Ah, I know you can't see that. So Patsy came on board, and we started looking at how do we do this in a, a method, in a in a way that's methodical and well thought out. So we became a satellite of their Title X program. Um, and uh, we received 340B uh, status, which means we could order the contraceptives at a, 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 a lower rate, but we didn't have bulk. So, so we decided not to go in that direction. Um, but we were, one thing we didn't put on here is that we were using the state health department to screen for our STDs. And that was another major uh, a point for partnering with Title X. And they, the health department would, San Juan Basin Health Department would be able to use the statistics from the adolescents and we would be able to use the standard of care. But we weren't using it for operating um, costs. So in order to do this though, we had to get an off-site pharmacy license, which is through the state. That wasn't di difficult. We do have a CLIA wavered lab in order to do the testing for STIs, STDs that we needed to do. And we had to figure out somehow how were we going to do summer coverage because initially we didn't, um, we didn't have the money to cover operations for that time. So uh, the way we do it, kids can get a walk-in or they can make an appointment. They have that one-time parental consent. They have one-time parental consent. However, if they don't have that, we will see kids one time without it, so that we can ex we can um, determine what is the problem and where can we get them care if we can't provide at the school-based health center. Our charts are integrated, as I mentioned before, and not only um, do we screen in terms of uh, Title X uh, screening procedures, we also screen generally for high-risk behaviors trauma, depression, and we use screening tools for those. And every student that's seen in the school-based health center is screened for trauma, depression, substance abuse, and other high-risk behaviors on top of the uh, Title X screening that's used for um, reproductive health. So we do do chlamydia, GC screening with a gen probe, um, and we screen urine or cervical. We also do HIV screening based on history. We have a low incidence rate, so even though it's recommended everybody be screened, we don't screen everyone in the school-based health center. As I mentioned, we use the state laboratory services through the health department uh, to process all of our labs. Um, and we have the CLIA lab so that we can do wet mounts on site. And then our contraceptives, which now come directly through the school-based health center, are mainly at this point pills, rings, and the depot, although we hope to do Implanon um, in the coming year. And uh, we follow these kids very closely. 
We see them often two weeks to one month to three months. We send slips um, every morning to uh, let them out of class and as a reminder for their appointments. And we have very few no-shows. Also, as part of the Title X program, we do comprehensive education as well as comprehensive care as needed. Um, so just in that comprehensive vein, these are all the different services we offer in addition to the Title X. The importance of this in terms of strategy is it's focusing on the whole child. And this is part of our messaging that we developed, and uh, I think it proved to be effective. So this is just looking at our visits in 2009, 2010. I don't have the ones for this year yet. But um, out of 1,350 students, um, we saw about 25 students per day. And as you can see, our Title X numbers, uh, we saw 404. Uh, those are 404 visits. And out of those 404 visits, we screened 10 kids for HIV who are very high risk. Uh, we did 125 um, CT and GC screens, and we had seven positives. And, uh, but what we're not seeing is we're still not seeing very many males. So we don't know. That is one of the efforts we want to focus on, but uh, getting males into the clinic for reproductive health, as in Title X clinics, it's, 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 it's difficult to do, but an area that really needs to be focused on. Um, and I'll let uh, Patsy talk a little bit about the funding for reproductive health. So the funding for reproductive health is primarily through Title X uh, funds that um, are funneled through our state health department and then distributed to local public health. And um, so that's been um, the primary uh, basis for our program. And in addition to that, as I was mentioning earlier, we took a piece of our maternal child health funds and our plan um, to use um, to provide a person from our health department to be a consultant with the school-based health center as they develop their satellite site, Title X satellite site. So again, it's, it's blended funding, as most of you are quite familiar with and um, becoming more familiar with as we go. And uh, it's particularly important to pull all the pieces together in a rural setting. Okay. And I know there's probably more questions about funding that um, Patsy can answer um, after we do the presentation. So we wanted to know um, what you, from your perspective as an audience, what do you think is the biggest challenge to providing reproductive health and STD screening in a school-based health center? So this is a poll. Uh, feel free to just kind of fill in, and, um, and hopefully we can address some of those issues. So in looking at the results so far, um, I think the biggest barrier is a conservative environment. And we'll try and address that a little bit more. And, uh, and then some uh, 23 were concerned about the, uh, this conservative environment. Um, one is lack of leadership, and eight people responded lack of funding, and then one was other. So once again, putting at the top, what you all are concerned about is challenges in a rural setting, and a conservative environment definitely is at the top of the list. Um, other challenges that, that we've encountered is recruiting providers. And our current um, practice act for nurse practitioners is very rigid. And um, so in rural areas, it's prohibiting us from recruiting nurse practitioners and mid-level providers. Um, and also, our, the amount of money that we have to offer is minimal. So it is a, um, a work of love. And we, we hate to be along that line, but until we can continue to develop funding, um, most of our providers are very dedicated to a public health model. 
medical sponsorship. We are one of the few school-based health centers, there's one other that's in Colorado, that is a standalone clinic. In other words, all of our funding goes through the school district. Um, we are trying to develop a medical sponsor, but our hospital will not be our medical sponsor. And what that means is that is a larger entity that the school-based health center would fall under. That entity would, um, the grants would, the financial funds would go through that, the providers would be employed by that entity, malpractice would be paid by that entity, um, and that would be considered a medical sponsorship. And we have not quite gotten to that point. We are still pretty much standalone, although we're moving in that direction. But the importance of this is you need a medical sponsor to get funding. Um, on a federal level, recently there's just been new funds. It's for equipment and op just for equipment and construction from the federal government. We don't know if we'll get operations for school-based health centers, but you need a medical sponsor. And uh, so that has been an issue for us. We're still working on it. Uh, limited resources for partnering. Patsy can talk to you about that. Limited resources in our community. Yeah, well, just because it we're, we are a small community, so um, we, we ask for support for a number of different things in our community. And this is one more on the list. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to find funding within our own community because we have limited capacity, just limited number of people with money and um, available to, uh, to provide funding. And that, that leads to the, the kind of the isolation we're trying to provide services, reproductive services. What are other people doing? So one thing I did in a partnership with the Colorado Association of School-Based Health Centers and hopefully every state has a state association of school-based health centers, but through that, um, down here we developed a rural health consortium. And that was developed several years ago, and what I wanted to do is bring together as many rural school-based health centers to talk about same thing, what are the problems, what are the barriers, and what are the new strategies that everybody's using to try and move forward. And that has been um, invaluable. So we meet twice a year. We have to drive long distances, but um, everybody shows up because the support is uh, what kind of keeps us going under uh, um, sometimes difficult circumstances. The other issue, confidentiality in a small town. Everybody wants to talk about everybody else. And we have to use um, uh, volunteers. And so we go through a whole training program with our volunteers around confidentiality. We have to set up the clinic around confidentiality. And everywhere in the clinic we have signs about confidentiality. It's an important part of the work that we do, especially around uh, STDs, treatment, screening, um, and reproductive health. Uh, capacity, many of us wear a million hats. You know, one day I write grants, the other day I'm a nurse practitioner, uh, Patsy is one day a director, another day she <laughs> is doing tetanus shots or <laughs> so, <laughs> reading PPDs or right. whatever. And this is what happens in a rural area, capacity becomes limited. And so creativity um, has to sneak in. And then sustainability. Even if you start something, how do you keep it going? So that is another one of the uh, major challenges that, uh, that we are dealing with. So. Um, I want to kind of finish this up talking about some strategies, and then we would love your input um, to get your ideas. And and one of the to talk about the top, one of the main strategies is you need a leader, passionate leader. And um, I have been passionate for ten years about school-based health centers, and uh, I have knocked on everybody's door. And I think that um, I'm well known in the area as the school-based health center lady, <laughs> um, and the and and that is something somebody to keep the momentum going because it does take a lot of of energy and work. Patsy and I have been involved in this from the beginning. The two of us are passionate about this, and um, and I think that you have to find those people in order to move forward. The other issue is timing and patience. You don't do it overnight. It's little teeny baby steps. And um, so when we started, I started talking to people probably in 2000 and 
four or five just to even get the conversation going. And sometimes it just starts with conversations with parents, with people that you network with, but it is a slow process. So patience is a, is a important uh, part of that strategy. And with students, so they understand what a school-based health center is and, and what uh, services are available to them there. When we did our um, needs assessment, the thing that moved us forward is at the time there were uh, probably that year 1,200 kids in the high school. Um, I put together a whole survey of questions as to what they wanted, what they needed, and 900 kids returned the survey. That had a huge impact on our advisory council, on the superintendent, in terms of the needs of kids. So um, that goes back to having some support at an upper level. If it's not the superintendent, then trying to gain support at least from a board member. Uh, what we did is because we got the superintendent's support, she was the one that talked to uh, the school board. And I, I never approached the school board. I never talked to them. She did. But once we got her support, she was on board 100%. Uh, the other strategy is coordinated school health puts a system in the school district for health on many, many, on eight different levels. And we, you need to look at reproductive health in terms of a system, part of a bigger system. We're not just doing reproductive health. We are helping kids stay in school. And these are on many different levels. So when you're looking at your dropout rates, when you're looking at graduation rates, we're looking at what really is becoming a public health issue. And so framing it in terms of a system is very important. Also, some people think school-based health centers are just a franchise. Hey, just like McDonald's, I met with uh, a whole group of superintendents from rural school, school districts, and they said, well, we want one. Uh, so how could we get one, and, um, and how soon can we sign up? And that is, it is not a franchise. It is a community-developed project. And it's about the community, and it's bringing the community together over the issues of our kids and our students in that community. And that may be an advantage that we have in a rural area because uh, many of us that are behind something like this or helping to create this meet on a daily basis, sometimes two to three times a day. I think this is about the third time I've seen Sherrod today. So uh, we are at the same meetings, at the same table, and having uh, a very um, uh, integrated and, and similar conversation about what we need for our community. So. In a rural area, that happens a lot, perhaps more than in a metropolitan area. And that networking, showing up, showing up, showing up at meetings. And I've never been, I go to a lot of meetings, but before we even started this, I've never been to more meetings in my life. And I would just show up at every meeting I could, Rotary, any get together to talk about the needs of the kids in our schools. And, um, and I brought data with me. So networking is important, creative funding. Um, I'm surprised we are the only school-based health center that has really done this Title X partnership because it has been a boon for us. Um, we look at grants, both Patsy and I write a lot of grants. We look at our rural status. We try and partner on grants. Um, and we try and use that to our advantage uh, for both parties on multiple grants. So creative funding is extremely important, and now we're we're even looking at partnering with a women's business group who thinks this is fantastic and want to partner with us on this. Um, the other, uh, the one last thing I really want to comment on in terms of strategies is policy development. You can, we have to, once we get something going, we still have to develop po policy as part of the sustainability. And so that's an area that um, requires other people that are outside of the of even the health field to develop these policies at the state. So I'm um, going to go to our last slide. Uh, and this is hopefully that we get to a point where it's peaceful and we can take a little canoe trip down the river, <laughs> uh, feel good about what we've done, and uh, share our experiences with each other. So thank you very much. And we really appreciate uh, your being at this webinar and look forward to also your questions. Thank you. 
Thanks, Sherrod, and uh, thank you, Patsy. You presented some wonderful things, some great information. And um, so at this time, we're going to go ahead and start the question and answer session. I have to say I've done um, a ton of these webinars in the past nine months, and this is the first time, oh, we just got one question in chat. First time there were no questions posted in chat during the presentation. I am I'm shocked. Um, one question that is in here is if if you guys will be able to receive a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes, of course. So um, I'll send a link to the archived recording, which is uh, includes the the visual and and the audio. But I'll also send a PDF of the presenter slides as well. Um, Okay, I have my next question in chat. How do you discuss body parts? We cannot call a body part what it is and have to make something up. Well, I think that probably goes back to working with your school board and working with your school district and the state. And I know that's difficult. Um, comprehensive sex education, which I think is uh, becoming more of a standard because the data shows that um, abstinence only not only does it not work, but uh, the cost of it is enormous. And this is probably one area, starting with the school board, um, starting with the health teachers, and going to the school board, and getting parents to support you that this type of education is um, behind is does not meet uh, any type of um, standards that are researched. And again, because we are a ta Title X satellite site, we also have the advantage of, of having protocols through Title X, which helps us address uh, some of those issues as well as how to l deliver the message along with some um, uh, health education and efforts. I, and I think more school districts a notion of evidence-based um, health curriculums. And I don't know if your state has standards, but our state does. And that's also, if you can talk, you have no standards in your state, you need to find a champion, a representative at the state um, who will work with you. So this is where the networking and the bigger picture and uh, trying to get more people involved in the issue is helpful. It won't happen overnight, but I know that this is an issue in many, many states. But it is because it does, if you look at the data and can take data with you, and also it's relationships. You know, it's talking to people and finding out what are their concerns, where, and listening to their kind of moral values that you understand, but using some data on what are happening to our children as well. Great, thank you for the answer. So I'm definitely getting more questions in the chat box. We're going to go through these. And given the number of participants we have on hand, if we get through all the chat box questions, I am going to open up the phone lines. So for those of you who would um, rather ask your question verbally as opposed to typing it in the chat box, just hold on to your seat, and we will be doing that shortly. So I'm going to go ahead and, and ask the next question. Um, could you repeat the reason why you require parental consent even for Title X services? That's a good question. And that was when we presented to parents and presented to the school board and presented um, throughout the, the school district, we, one of our uh, prime Focuses was that we want we want parental involvement in the school-based health center, and so by getting that permission from parents, it it brought in um, it kind of brought them as partners into into the care that's being provided. Now, most of the the reproductive care that we provide is confidential, and that parents had to understand when they signed the consent form that they could not cherry pick. They either consent or don't consent. So that if a student comes in, there's no parental consent, um, we have a conversation with the parent and um, 
at, at the request of the student. If the student says, no, I don't want my parent involved, then we try and get them into services um, elsewhere rather than the school-based center. But we're just trying to create this partnership so that we are not taking care away from parents, but helping parents understand that adolescents need to start advocating for themselves and their, for their own health care. So that was the reason. Great. The next question is from Holly Watkins, and she asks, how did you get all of this past government entities, for example, the state legislature? Well, I, this has probably been a 10-year process. And uh, at the legislature, I was not involved in the initial process for our comprehensive sex ed bill. So that was advocated by um, several senators and representatives um, throughout the state, but I was not part of it. Although the Colorado Association of School-Based Health Centers has always been a part of what's going on in terms of policy, and uh, they, have, um, uh, they have representatives that are constantly working with senators and uh, folks at the state level to advocate for kids. So, but that that's been a long-term policy, but it uh, or long-term process, but it really started before I was involved. Great, thank you. Megan Davis asks, have you had many complaints from parents or school officials? Really, very few. Um, those that have had complaints have been pretty vocal and fairly uh, persistent in voicing their. Their complaints, but really, uh, in terms of number of of people, uh, it's been small. And uh, we had one major vocal person who moved to Washington D.C. Um, but in the letters to the editor, uh, it was amazing uh, the responses that we got from parents supporting what we were doing in the newspaper, feeling that they did not have the skills really to discuss this with their children. Uh, they, didn't, they were not up to date on what was available, not available, and their, and their children wouldn't even talk to them about the subject. So to have an entity um, that would provide the resources that parents could not provide, we got a lot of letters of support from parents around that. And may, I just wanted to add, we do have a parent um, group so parents come in and we teach them how to talk to their teens. And that has been another good strategy for getting parents involved. And it's amazing the, the parents that say, I, I don't really know what to do. We are also willing to see kids and parents together to help the parent and coach the parent. Uh, we do it on the phone. We coach the parent and the child. So we'll do multiple approaches to, to get support. Thank you. Our next question comes from Emily Holmes. She says, I believe I heard it, it was mentioned that gonorrhea and chlamydia, hold on, gonorrhea and chlamydia testing is done somewhat selectively at the school-based health center. What is the chlamydia positivity rate at the center? Uh, chlamydia is done really um, on, on pretty much every uh, every patient, but the patients, I can't give a positivity rate because kids will say, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. So we encourage testing, but we don't demand testing in order for them to receive services. So we don't really know what our positivity rate is because we can't do it on every single kid. Um, they won't consent to it. But it's getting better and better. But um, we encourage uh, testing now through urine. Before we would, you know, before the urines were really available, people had to do a cervical and or uh, urethral, and most kids would say no way. Mm -hmm. So it's gradually we're getting more testing done, but it's really having to do with the tests that are available, such as the urine. And we're getting away more from uh, physical exams. We're getting more um, just uh, away from in terms of reproductive health, it's more counseling, 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 and testing, testing, testing. So 
there, there's been some changes over time, so I can't give you a specific positivity. Okay, thanks. Um, and forgive me if you've mentioned this already, but one of the other questions in the chat is, is the entire state of Colorado mandated to provide comprehensive sex ed? If so, when did that legislation go through? And uh, the person writing this question is Brianne Anderson, and she mentioned that it is actually district by district choice uh, where she resides. It is, it is uh, mandated for the state of Colorado, and uh, that legislation passed in 2007. And it is indeed very helpful to have that kind of legislation to back you up. Absolutely. Okay. The next question is, is stigma or discrimination around LGBTQTS folks seen in this community? And, and when it comes to HIV and STD risk, how is it addressed? Uh, I think any community has some stigma around LGBTQTS. Uh, in our high school, we have a club and a lot of schools uh, don't allow that. We have a club for those kids, and we also uh, promote um, acceptance, and we have different days to promote acceptance. So we do a lot of work around um, uh, that issue. And in terms of testing, um, with the individual student, it comes from uh, sitting down and having a conversation with them and, in tr and establishing trust. So our, often our visits are half hour to an hour. So when I first see a kid, sometimes those visits go for an hour. And it's amazing. We do a lot of screening initially on paper to find out kind of what their issues are. We do screen for if they have sexual issues, if they have concerns um, that they can write out on the piece of paper. We try and address them. And as we establish trust, uh, more of that information comes out from the student. We also have a behavioral health therapist on hand if the student is really struggling. So I think we provide a lot of support in multiple areas for that. So how is it addressed? It's addressed comprehensively. Great, thank you for that. Next question. Also, how are the youth's perception, oh, I guess, what's the youth's perception regarding the need for parental consent? Well, I think um, we, whenever I see a student, uh, the first thing we do when we, uh, a new student establish a chart, we look to see if they have parental consent. and. If, and most, majority of our students do. Parents just sign it at registration. And I think um, as the school-based health center becomes uh, more and more positive in the eyes of parents, that has been less of an issue to get that consent. Students, if their parents don't have consent, uh, we sit down and talk to the student that they don't have consent. Um, and we want to know what the issues are and then how can we best address it with the student, and how does the student, the student want us to proceed with the parent. So we kind of do it as a partnership with the student, and I think they feel respected as part of making these decisions. Absolutely. Next question comes from Megan Davis. She asks, how do you handle partner notification for your positive STD test? Um, so we do it multiple ways, and once again, it's working with the students. Some of our students have older partners, and they don't even live in Colorado. Uh, they may live in New Mexico. They may have left the state. So uh, we try and do it by writing a script. We try and do it by do they want us to contact the partner. So uh, we always offer it, and it depends on the circumstances whether or not it um, actually is followed through. Thank you. What, are, what strategies do you have to reach more males in the future? Well, again, that's been a focus for 
our um, Title X program at the health department. And part of our strategy, we've been trying to make that well known in the community. And again, because we have a small community, that's not as difficult to, to approach. But also, um, word of mouth works well with adolescents, as you well know, um, that we have um, uh, friends who talk to friends and, and help them understand what's available to them and that this is also available to males. And um, so our numbers, at least at the, at the health department site for Title X, have definitely been increasing. And one thing we're doing at the School-Based Health Center, we have a peer education group, and they pick their own name. It's called POW, uh, Peers Owning Wellness. And that is our ambassadors for uh, reaching students out into the school. So they wear these T-shirts, and they are part of being part of this group is them learning how to work with their peers on education and um, providing support around STDs and reproductive health. So that has been a great strategy. They also uh, would like to put together a Facebook just around these issues. And uh, we do have a website. The website, I don't think kids go to the website. They're really, their main uh, focus is Facebook. And so social media, mm -hmm. media is where we need to go to spread the word. So it's word of mouth, social media. And um, also we've tried to make little videos and uh, we put um, the health department has put ads in our student newspaper um, that are really funny and to try and catch the eye of males, and so that's another strategy that we're using. Great. Uh, our next question: They want to know, would you be willing to share the needs assessment survey you developed for the students? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Great. Oh yeah, it, it, it was just yeah. I just kind of made it up, and I'm I'm always willing to share kind of where to begin. I would Fantastic. probably ask different questions now than I did at the beginning. And um, I'd like to just comment on that as well. In that, getting your student council when we put together advisory council, we had students on it, yeah. and so they had input in the survey. They had input in what was going on. And that was invaluable. Uh, they were all there at the ribbon cutting. And, um, and I think keeping that in mind, always have the kids involved because it's them that have the perspective on what's going to work the best. That's really true. It's they. Great. So at this point in time, we have no more questions in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead. We um, still have around a little over 15 minutes left for questions if, if we need to use it. Um, and I know some of you may prefer to ask the question over the phone. So at this time I'm going to unmute everyone. We ask that if you are not asking a question, please press star 6 to keep your line muted. And if you do plan to ask a question, um, you can unmute your line when you wait your turn, after you wait your turn you press star 7. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. The conference has been unmuted. So if you'd like to ask a question, please go ahead and state your name and, and where you're located. <laughs> And if you are not planning to ask a question, please press star 6 to mute your line. So go ahead. The floor is open. Whoever feels like taking the first go, please, please state your name.
speakers, do you have any questions for our audience that you would like to ask them? I, I, I would love to ask kind of some of the barriers that the audience is facing and what their thoughts are on how they might address those. Because um, I know it, it, it just varies around the country. Um, this is Bree Anderson in Michigan. One of the barriers that we're facing is that we cannot provide family planning in schools and school-based health centers due to um, legislation. So it's fascinating to me that you guys are able to do that. And the, what is the legislation absolutely prohibits on absolutely. school sites? Correct. Dispensing or providing um, birth control of any type any type of contraception, even condoms. So we are a school-linked health center. We're an uh -huh. office, so we are able to do that in our clinic here, but anything that's on school grounds, you absolutely cannot. Is that, that Michelle Bachman? <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> Is that throughout Michigan, did you say? Yep, the entire state. So that's why the comprehensive sex ed, um, we're the ones that have it district to district as well, so it's just very patchy. Um, yeah. You never know what kids are going to get, and you know a lot of places are abstinence only, which translates to absolutely nothing. Right. And do you have support? Have there been any legislators that um, are aware of the issues in your state? And I don't. Know, and I don't know what the the rates of adolescents in Michigan are, but I can imagine it's probably pretty high. Yes. Um, we recently went from a pretty Democratic to Republican mm -hmm. legislature, both houses as well as governor. So right. even if there was some political will at some point that's sort of been sucked up through the straw, yeah. and um, <laughs> it's going to take some major legislative education, I think, in a couple of years. Um, they're pretty focused on budget stuff right now. Right. right. Under the pretense of, <laughs> of uh, trying to get abortion. Um, preventing abortion. But I think if you can be patient and keep networking with those um, at the state level who do have some support for this issue to keep it alive. Because I, you know, I think we're in a, this is a trend. I, I'm not a political expert, but we're certainly seeing it everywhere. The trend from Democratic to Republican or to more conservative, and I think it's going to swing back. But keeping, having at least at the legislative le uh, um level, keeping them aware of what the facts are, what's happening to the kids. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Do you have a question for our presenters or want to comment on some barriers you're facing in your community? Okay, I'm going to take the multiple seconds of silence as a no, and that we are finished. Thank you so much, Sherrod and, um, or Sherrod, I'm sorry, I keep on mispronouncing <laughs> your name. It's a name, it's okay, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Patsy, thank you for presenting on this topic. I, I found it to be very informative, very useful. Um, and I hope our participants did as well. Um, so as everyone knows, we will send the archived recording and the set of slides and any uh, materials that our presenters would like to also include and have me share with you. I will be emailing you within a week from today. Additionally, when you leave this presentation, you will be autom automatically directed to a short web evaluation. So please complete that. It's very important for us to receive your feedback. Um, the whole reason we had this webinar, one of the many reasons we had this webinar was the feedback we received from our participants last September. 
So your feedback is, is extremely important. Thank you so much, uh, and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Please stand by.